Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Judith Bishop. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the plenary session of the Microsoft Faculty Summit. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you today Leslie Lamport, who's a principal researcher at our Microsoft Research Silicon Valley Lab. So students and faculty who have taught operating systems courses, as well as anybody who's really used a computer, will have benefited from Leslie's work on logical clocks, safety and liveness, sequential consistency, and many other parts of operating systems which laid the basis for the safe operation of the computers that we have today as they moved from the single desktop to the large number of interconnected devices we have. Leslie, before he joined Microsoft, was a member of certain various um, prestigious institutions. He was at MIT, at Brandeis University, and at companies such as DEC, Compaq, and SRI. In uh, his career, he has also received several um, honorary doctorates, and he has tried very hard to help scientists see their work as beautiful. And for that purpose, he also developed something that I think you all know very well, which is LATIC. He's now going to go on and try and persuade engineers that there's something else that is beautiful in life, which is mathematics. And that's what he's going to talk to us about today. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for this year's AM Turing Award winner, Leslie Lamport. Thank you, Judith. Thinking above the code. Why do we think? Uh, well, it helps us do most things, like hunting a saber-toothed tiger, or building a house, or writing a program. So when should we think? Well, hunting a saber-toothed tiger, we should think before leaving the cave. When the tiger is uh, charging at you, it's a little late. Building a house. Before beginning construction, you don't want to think about what you're doing when uh, the, you know, the carpenters are putting the roof on, or at least start thinking about what you're doing. Writing a program we should be thinking before we start writing any code. How to think. One of my favorite quotes is from the cartoonist Gwyndon, who says, writing is nature's way of letting you know how sloppy your thinking is. To think, to really think, you have to write. If you're thinking without writing, chances are you're fooling yourself. You only are pretending to think. What to write? Well, hunting a saber-toothed tiger, sorry, writing wasn't invented then, which meant it was a very dangerous activity. <laughs> building a house. Well, what you write before you build, start building a house are called blueprints. And it's called drawing blueprints. Writing a program. Well, you should also write a blueprint of your program. But blueprints of programs are what we call specifications. Specifications, well, when I say the word, people tend to panic. This formal stuff that's uh, impossible to read and understand, and you have to learn these funny symbols and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, this is a blueprint, you know, all this complicated stuff going on. But this is also a blueprint. Uh, in fact, there's an entire spectrum of blueprints, ranging from very detailed, complicated uh, blueprints, which you need if you're building something that's very big and complicated. At the other end, they're just rough sketch if what you're building is just something you know, really simple that you're going to do in the weekend. And 
there are these ordinary blueprints for you know, things like a house or uh, the stuff that, um, kinds of blueprints that uh, most of us might have seen. And similarly, there's a spectrum of specifications. There are formal specifications. And on the other end of the, of the you know, formal specifications written in a, in a precise formal language, and on the other end, there are just short prose specifications. And in the middle are what I like to call mathematical prose. Most code is really simple. A few uh, sentences of prose will do. Uh, some code is subtle, uh, it requires more thought. And for that, uh, you have to write, it, it's prose, but it's, you try to be, you need to be pretty precise. And some code is either very complex or very subtle or critical. And that's especially the case if what you're doing is uh, writing a concurrent or a distributed system. It is going to be complex and subtle and quite likely critical. And for that, you should have tools. You should be using tools to check it, to check your blueprints. And if you're going to use tools, it means you need a formal language because tools don't understand prose. So how to write a spec? Well, writing requires thinking. So how to think about programs? We should think about programs like computer scientists, namely like scientists. Uh, scientific thinking is a very successful way of thinking. We know all that it's brought us. And what science does is make mathematical models of reality. For example, the first very successful science was astronomy. Uh, the reality, planets have mountains, oceans, tides, and weather, and all sorts of complicating things. But the simple model that's uh, gotten astronomy pretty far is to think of a planet, a model of planet, as a point mass having position and momentum. Computer science, the reality consists of digital systems, things like a processor chip, a game console, or a computer executing a program. Uh, this is what I'll be talking about, computers executing programs. Uh, but what I have to say applies to all those other things just as well. So models, there are lots of models that you've probably come across, Turing machines, partially ordered set of events, you probably haven't run across that, and you know, lots of models. But two, to my mind, stand out as being the most useful basic models. Functions and sequences of states. So functions. We model a function, uh, a, we can model a program as a function that maps an input or to an output, or multiple inputs to, or possible inputs to possible outputs. In math, the function is very simple. It's, an order, it's a set of ordered pairs. So for example, the square function on natural numbers, it's this set of ordered pairs, this pair 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 4, etc. And the element 2, 4 is an element of this set of uh, the fact that the, that the pair 2, 4 is an element of this square function is usually expressed by saying square of 2 equals 4. Now the domain of, of square, the domain of a function, are all the first elements of those pairs. So for the square function, the domain is the set numbers 0, 1, 2, and 3, etc., also known as the natural numbers that I like to write as nat. To, spe to define a function, what you do is you specify the do its domain. So to specify square, we say the domain of square is equal to the set of naturals. And for each element x in its domain, we'd s we specify what square maps x to, and it maps the 
value x to x squared. So that defines the square function. Now, functions in math are not the same as functions in programming languages. Math is much simpler. I'm not a programming language expert, so I don't know uh, what those things that programming languages call functions are. Uh, but I know what math is, that math functions are, are a lot simpler. Now, the functions model will take you very far, and it's very useful, but it has limitations. Its limitation, main limitation, is that it specifies what a program does, but not how it does it. So, for example, quicksort and bubble sort compute the same function, uh, but they're very different programs. Also, some programs don't just map inputs to outputs. Some programs run forever. Well, you know, they may stop before the, the sun explodes, but it's useful to think of them as running forever. Uh, for example, operating systems. You can't specify an operating system as a function because it doesn't map inputs to outputs. So for that, for those uh, specifications, you use what I like to call the standard behavioral model, in which a program execution is represented by a behavior. A behavior is a sequence of states. And a state is an assignment of values to variables. And a program is modeled by a set of behaviors, which behaviors that represent all possible executions of the program. So for example, let's look at Euclid's algorithm. An algorithm is just an abstract program. Uh, as you all undoubtedly know, it computes the greatest common divisor of two natural of two integers m and n by initializing x to m and y to n, and then it keeps subtracting the smaller the, from the larger. And when x and y are equal, then it stops because that x and y equals the GCD of m and n. So for m equals 12 and n equals 18. There's just one possible behavior. It starts with a state in which that assigns 12 to x and 18 to y. And then subtract. the next state is obtained by subtracting the smaller from the larger, x from y. So you get, reach a state where x equals 12 and y equals 18 minus 12, or 6. And in the next state, you subtract the smaller, which is y, from the larger. And you wind up in a state in which x equals 6 and y equals 6. And since x and y are equal, you stop. So it's a very simple algorithm. It has just one possible behavior. So how do we describe a set of behaviors? Well, first of all, there's a theorem that says any set B of behaviors is the, conjunct the intersection of two sets, a set of behaviors satisfying a safety property and a set of behaviors satisfying a liveness property. So what are safety and liveness? Well, I'm not going to bother going into you know, the formal definitions. But a safety property is false if and only if it can be violated at some point during the behavior. So partial correctness is an example. Partial correctness is violated if the program stops with the wrong answer. So at some point in the behavior, you can tell that, it, that it, the property was violated, the point at which the program stopped with the incorrect uh, answer. The Leibniz property is one in which you need to see the complete behavior in order to know if it's false or if it's not satisfied by the, by the program. Classic example is termination. You can't tell that the program hasn't terminated by looking at any finite piece of the program. You have to look at the entire behavior to know that it never terminates. So we satisfy, specify a set of behaviors with, by specifying a safety property and a liveness property. Now in practice, specifying safety just turns out to be more important uh, because that's where errors are most likely to occur and tend to be more subtle. I mean, liveness is important, just not as important as safety. And so to save time, I'm going to ignore liveness today and just talk about safety. So how to specify a safety property? We specify it with two things. 
the set of possible initial states, and the next state relation, which describes all possible successor states of any state. So what language should we use to write these things? Well, let's act like scientists. What language do the scientists use? And the language is mathematics. That's the language of science. So the set of initial states, they're described by a formula. So in Euclid's algorithm, the set of initial states, we initialize, the initial state is one in which x equals m and y equals n. So that is specified, that initial state is specified by this formula. And the only pot, this has only one, it's only one possible initial state that satisfies that formula. The next state relation is also described by a formula. And to describe it, I'll use unprimed variables to talk about the current state, or the first state of the pair, and prime variables for talking about the next state. So let's look at the next state relation for Euclid's algorithm. There are two possibilities, either x is greater than y or y is greater than x. So that formula is going to be the disjunction of two, of two formulas. Uh, if x is greater than y, then the new value of x, x prime, is equal to what you get by subtracting y from it. So its new value of x prime is equal to the old value of x minus the old value of y. And the new value of, x of y is equal to the old value. So that first formula is specified by all pairs of states satisfying x greater than y and in the initial state, in the first state, x prime equals x minus y and y prime equals y. Or the, okay, you understand what I, uh, what I said. Uh, and that describes one, one possibility or the disjunction of these formulas to so the other case. It's or y is greater than x in the first state and the value of y in the new state is the value of y in the old state minus the value of x in the old state, etc. So this simple formula describes the next state relation of Euclid's algorithm. So let's see how it works. How you get behaviors out of those two formulas. Well, for, example, for an example, I'll take m equal to 12 and n equals 18. So to get the initial state, we look at the initial predicates, predicate, and we substitute 12 for m and 18 for n, for, what, uh, for n rather. And you see under that substitution, there's only one pair of values, x and y, that satisfy this relation, x equals 12 and y equals 18. So to get the next state, the second state, we apply the next state look formula, substituting 12 for x and 18 for y. And we do that, notice that 12 greater than 18 is false, and 18 greater than 12 is true. Well, false and anything is false, so that first half of the formula is false. True and anything is equal to the rest of the formula. So this formula is satisfied by the old value of x being 12 and the new value of x being 18 minus 12 or 6. So this is the only possible next state that satisfies this next relation when for the initial state x equals 12 and y equals 18. Okay, to find the next state we do the same thing. We substitute 12 for x and, y and 6 for y. We simplify, we see that 6 greater than 12 is false and 12 greater than 6 is true. So the formula simplifies to x prime equals 12 minus 6 and y prime equals 6. Uh, so it tells us that the only possible successor state, the only possible third state is x equals 6 and y equals 6. And to find the next state, well, we do the same thing. We substitute 6 for x and 6 for y. And we see that the entire formula is false. And there are no values of x prime and y prime which can make the formula false true. So there is no next state. So there's no next state means the program is stopped. So that's Euclid's algorithm. 
And what we see special about Euclid's algorithm is that for any values of x and y, there are unique values of x prime and y prime that make next true. There's either one value or no values. So Euclid's algorithm is deterministic. To model non-determinism, we just have a next state relation that allows multiple next states for a current state. There's nothing magic, you know, terribly difficult, you know, hard about, about non-determinism. Multiple assignments of values to prime variables that make next true for a single assignment of values to unprime variables. That's what non-determinism is all about. OK, what about formal specs? We need formal specifications only to apply tools. I mean, mathematicians, you know, before there were any tools, you know, wrote math, you know, in very, you know, in informal notation. If they want to use Mathematica, though, they have to, you know, write in the language of Mathematica. So if we want to apply tools, we need a formal language. And the language that I'm going to describe or that I use is called TLA+. So this so this pair of uh, formulas are written just like this in TLA+. Uh, we need to, uh, the formal language, we need to write declarations. We declare X, M and N to be constants and X and Y to be variables. Uh, and then add a little boilerplate. We said it extends the integers. The integers are a standard module that defines things like plus and minus and greater than. And we put them inside of a module, which I've called module Euclid. And that's a TLA plus specification of Euclid's algorithm. And this is what it looks like in ASCII. Uh, now, you can model check TLA plus specs. Now, model checking uh, conceptually checks all possible executions of the program on a very small model. Um, it's extremely effective and you know, quite easy to do. You know, you basically tell the model checker what the model is. Models are usually, you know, instantiating values of constants. So for Euclid's algorithm, we'd have to tell it what M and N equals. And then the model checker will go through and in, you know, a few nanoseconds for something that simple, we'll, we'll check all the one possible ver uh, behavior. And you can write formal correctness proofs and check them mechanically in TLA, you know, with, uh, write the proofs in TLA plus, and we have a theorem prover that can check the proofs. But that's hard work. And uh, well, all this is math stuff we know, you know, is really very well, nice and pretty and stuff, but we know that math works only for toy examples. To model real system, you need a real language with types, procedures, objects, and all of that. Meh. Wrong. Let me quote something written by Chris Newcomb, who's an Amazon engineer. He said, we have used TLA plus on 10 large complex real world systems. In every case, TLA plus has added significant value, either preventing su subtle, serious bugs from reaching production, or giving us enough understanding and confidence to make aggressive performance optimizations without sacrificing correctness. One of the other things people will tell you about formal methods is, oh, if you use a formal method, you're really going to kill your performance. Well, in fact, it's just the opposite. And the other thing they'll tell you is, oh, management will never let us do it. Well, management at Amazon are now encouraging teams to write TLA plus specs uh, and in annual planning, managers are allocating engineering time to use TLA+. This was written in 2013. I think there are a few more systems that they've been specifying since then. The Xbox 360 memory system. Uh, Chuck Thacker had an, an intern write a TLA plus spec of uh, the Xbox memory system. And just writing the spec, didn't even get to the point of model checking it. He caught a bug that the designers of, of the memory system at IBM, after scratching their heads and looking at it, said, yeah, that was a bug. And that would not have been caught by their testing procedures. 
and that bug would have caused every Xbox in the world to crash after four hours of use. You can learn about TLA Plus on the web. Uh, today, I'm not going to be talking about TLA+, I'm going to be talking about informal specifications. And I'll start with an example. Uh, TLA Tech, which is the pretty printer for TLA+. Uh, here is what somebody user, TLA Plus user might write. Uh, some silly formula like this. And if you just did the naive output, you know, just, you know, took things from, you know, teletype font and put them into, uh, you know, translated the ASCII into the symbols, left slash, right slash, into the conjunction symbol and that. You'd get something like uh, that formula on the right. But alignment is actually, uh, has significance in TLA+. Uh, and the user undoubtedly wanted, the, well, he certainly wanted the left uh, conjunction symbols aligned because the formula might mean something different otherwise. And he also probably wanted those equal signs aligned. Uh, so this is the right output that the pretty printer should produce for this example. On the other hand, if you look at this input, this is what the naive output would be like. And the user probably didn't want those two symbols aligned. That was probably just an accidental alignment. So in this case, the naive output is the correct output. It's what you want. Well, there is no precise definition of correct alignment. Correctness means what the user wants, and there's no way of formally specifying what the user wants. Um, so, obviously, if we can't specify correctness, specification, you know, what good can specification we need to specify correctness? What could, how can we use specification? Well, we can. Not knowing what a program should do doesn't mean you don't have to think, you just, you know, just code. It means you have to think a lot harder. Which means that that's when a spec is even more important, when you don't know what the program is supposed to do. And, and it seems impossible to even say what it should do. Because it has to do something and you have to decide what it should do. So that requires a lot of thinking, which requires writing. So what did I do? Well, my spec consisted of six rules plus definitions. And these were in, you know, informal, you know, quote, mathematical prose, informal. It, they were written in comments. Oh, here's an example of one of the rules. It says, a left comment token is left comment aligned with its covering token. Well, I don't even know what that means anymore. I'd have to read the spec. But left comment aligned and covering token are terms that were defined in the, uh, in the specification I wrote. And if you look at it, this is really mathematical prose. Uh, why did I write this spec? Well, it was a lot easier to understand and debug six rules than 850 lines of code. Probably would have been more than 850 lines of code if I hadn't written those rules first. And I did a lot of debugging of the rules. Uh, you know, you write a bunch of rules and you know, what they're going to do is not obvious. And you try a bunch of examples. And uh, I add the debugging code so I could see what rules were being applied. And you know, we would do something weird and I say, oh, that rule needs to be modified for this. And you know, an iterative process. And, uh, the few bugs in implementing the rules were easy to catch. There was no problem. Had I just written the code, it would have taken me much longer to just get something I could live with. And I'm sure the results wouldn't have produced formatting nearly as good. So why not a formal spec? Why didn't I write a TLA plus spec? Well, several reasons. First of all, getting it right was not that important. The world is not going to come crashing down if something isn't quite properly aligned in pretty printing. Uh, in particular, it didn't have to work in all corner cases because, you know, you know there's no way of getting it, you know, totally right. And just as important, there aren't any tools that could help me. The model checker wouldn't have helped in this example because, you know, you need some, some properties to check it against and, uh, you know, uh, just, just tools were not 
you know, uh, TLA plus tools are not designed for that kind of problems. So what's typical about this spec? The spec is at a higher level than the code. It could have been implemented in any language. No method or tool, none of, the fa none of your favorite ways of, you know, programming methodologies would have been worth a damn here. They would not have helped me write the spec because uh, no method of writing you know, better code would have made the spec unnecessary. I had to write the spec. It was not code. And it says nothing about how to write the code. You can implement my spec in any language. You write a spec to help you think about the problem before you think about the code. So what's not typical about this spec, well, it's quite subtle. Remember I said 95% of uh, code people write uh, requires less thought and you know, simpler, shorter specs are good enough. Also, it's a set of rules. A set of rules or requirements or axioms is usually a bad spec because it's really hard to understand. It turns out that that was a good match for this particular problem, which says, you know, there are no universal rules about you know, how to write specs. Uh, you know, there are no universal rules that'll tell you how to write any program in the world. So specifying how to compute a function. Specifying what the pretty printer should do was hard. Implementing the spec was easy. Specifying what a sorting program should do is easy. Figuring out how to implement it efficiently is hard, at least if nobody has showed you how. Uh, it requires thinking, which requires writing a specification. So I'll give you an example of a specification for quicksort. Uh, you've probably all seen quicksort. Quicksort is you know, written by Tony Hoare. It's a divide and conquer algorithm for sorting an array. Call it A0 to AN minus 1. And for simplicity, I'll assume that's an array of numbers. And it uses a partition procedure. You give it two arguments, low and high. And what that procedure does is it chooses a pivot po a point pivot, a number in low to high minus 1. And then it, it permutes the elements to the left of the pivot, a low to a high. Uh, it, you know, it permutes uh, the number, the, the part of the array within the limit from low to high, so that everything from pivot downwards is, becomes, is less than or equal to everything from pivot plus one upwards. Uh, so fortunately, you've all seen quicksort before, so my uh, rambling description isn't necessary. Uh, and for this example, I don't care how this procedure is implemented. Of course, that's the real trick of, of quicksort, implementing that. But you know, I only have 50 minutes here. So, uh, so let's specify quicksort and pseudocode. You know, specify the partition procedure is pick a pivot in low to high minus 1 and permute a low to a high to make blah, 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 and return the value pivot. And you have a recursive procedure. QS applied to low and high. And if low is less than high, you call the partition procedure for on low and high. And then you recursively call the procedure for the two uh, subintervals. Uh, and if low is not less than high, then it means you have uh, one element uh, and there's nothing to sort, and so you're done. And the main program just applies QS to the entire array from 0 to n minus 1. So uh, informal, no formal syntax, uh, no declarations, you know, pseudocode, it's, it's a fine specification. You, know, you can code, you know, pretty trivial to code from this in you know, any programming language. Uh, easy to understand. But is it really quicksort? It's the way quicksort is almost always described. But recursion is not a form fundamental part of quicksort. It's just one way of implementing divide and conquer. Now, here's a problem. And in fact, it's probably not the best way if you want to execute uh, 
this on multiple cores. So here's a problem you give to your friends and colleagues. Write a non-recursive version of quicksort. Almost no one can do it in 10 minutes. They try to compile the recursive version, and nobody can get, almost nobody can get that right in 10 minutes standing on their feet. But I'll tell you, you know, what the real solution is. What we do is maintain a set U of index ranges on which partition needs to be called. Initially, U equals contain, is a set containing a single uh, index range from 0 to n minus 1, represented by this pair. Now, we could write this in pseudocode, but let's be scientists. Let's write init and next directly in mathematics. So the initial predicate says a is equal to any array of numbers of length n, and u is equal to the set consisting of that single element. Yeah, this was, is informal mathematics, but it's informal. You know, we could write some formal way of describing the set of any, uh, any array of numbers of length n. And before writing next, let me make a definition. Let me define partitions of B pivot low high. It's the set of arrays obtained from B by permuting B low to B high with pivot point pivot. In other words, it's the set of all values that the partition procedure, the set of all new values of A that the partition procedure is allowed to return if it's also returning pivot as the pivot point. And I won't bother writing it out precisely. So next, remember, is going to be a relation between the old values of A and U and the new values, A prime and U prime. So let's write it. First of all, we're going to stop if U is the empty set. So the next state relation says U is not equal to the empty set and. So the formula is going to be false if U is the empty set. Then we pick any pair BT in U. And if B is not equal to T, then we pick any point P, any number P lying in B to T minus 1. And we let A prime be any element of the set of legal partitions, you know, the results of the partition function, that if you've given it B and T is the input, and it returns P as the uh, partition, uh, as the pivot point. And then U prime is a set U. We're finished with the element BT, so we remove that from the set. And then we add the two subintervals, BP and, you know, to B and P plus 1 to T, into the set U of, of, of um, ranges that still need to be sorted. Otherwise, if B is, not, is equal to T, then there's nothing to do. Uh, we leave A prime A, uh, unchanged, and we let U prime equal U with BT removed. We just take BT out of, out of the set. And that's the next state relation. That describes a very nice way of doing quicksort iterative, iter iteratively. It's actually a more general algorithm, because if you look at all the behaviors it can produce, uh, the set of behaviors produced by the recursive version is a subset. That is, the set of all uh, sequences of values that A assumes is going to be a subset of the ones that uh, this next state relation allows. So why can almost no one find this version of quicksort? Because people's minds are stuck in code. They haven't thought learned to think at a higher level than the code. Now, it's easy to write this as a precise formula. Pick any arbitrary value is really existential quantification. The formula is true if there exists a value B, T, and U. Uh, similarly there. And just that letting A prime be any element of this set, well, that's easy enough to write, is A prime in an element of, of that. And those relations, new values of U prime, those things to the 
with prose to the right of the uh, equal sign, uh, they're easy to uh, express. Whoops. Uh, uh, this way, and uh, so on. Then, so what you have is a TLA plus formula here, uh, perfectly formal. If you prefer pseudocode, uh, we have plus cal. It looks like a toy programming language, and the algorithm, in fact, appears in a comment in TLA plus module. But an expression can be any TLA plus expression. It also has some constructs for non-determinism. But the fact that it can be any TLA an expression can be any TLA plus expression, which means any expression of mathematics, makes it enormously powerful, more, more expressive than anything any programming language uh, has uh, designer has ever dreamed of. Uh, and it gets compiled to an easy to understand TLA plus spec. And in fact, I regularly uh, write things in plus cal, and then when I'm proving the correctness of them, I reason directly about the uh, TLA plus specification. And you apply the TLA plus tools, the model checker and theorem prover to, uh, the, plus, to the translation. Programs that run forever. I've been talking about programs that compute a function. Programs that run forever usually involve concurrency. Things like operating systems, distributed systems. Few people can get them right by just thinking and writing. I'm not one of them. We need tools to check uh, what we're doing. The reason the TLA Plus was so useful to the Amazon engineers is because the model checker. So for concurrent distributed systems, you need to write something, you know, use TLA Plus or Plus Cal. It was designed for distributed systems. Uh, it's great. And you're not going to get a dis you know, distributed concurrent algorithm right if you don't model. Check it. It's spe you don't write a specification and check it. Uh, the other 95%, really simple stuff. Here is uh, an example of uh, a spec you know, that I write, wrote in, in a program. Uh, why did I write that spec? To be sure I knew what the code should do before writing it. Without writing a spec, I only thought it was obvious what it should do. I had to write the spec to be sure it was really as simple and as obvious as I thought it was. And later, I didn't have to read the code to know what that piece of code I wrote did. I just wrote the specification, could read the specification. So a general rule, that's one you know, rule at least we can say about specs in general. If you're writing a spec of what a code should do, of what a piece of code should do, that should say everything that anyone needs to know to use the code. How the code worked in the example I've just showed was just too simple to require a spec. I mean, if it, was, if it turned out to be harder than I thought, I would have discovered that when I started coding, and I would have stopped coding and, wrote, and written a specification. So what programmers should know about thinking? What everyone should know about thinking? Everyone thinks they think. <laughs> but if you don't write down your thoughts, you're fooling yourself. What programmers should know about thinking is that you should think before you code, which means you should write before you code. A spec is simply what you write before coding. So what code should you, you know, what do I mean by code? What should you specify? Basically, any piece of code that someone else might want to use or modify. And you know, that somebody else is likely to be you in a month when you've forgotten what this piece of code you've written does. Uh, it could be an entire program or system, a class, a method, just a tricky piece of code inside of a method. What should you specify about the code? What it does, which means everything anyone needs to know to use it, and perhaps how it does it. If it's complicated, subtle, and you need to think hard about it in order to get it right. Uh, and this is you know, what's sometimes called an algorithm or a high-level design. How should you think 
about or specify your code above the code level in terms of states and behaviors or functions for input-output relations. You should do it mathematically as rigorously and formally as is necessary. You should be thinking mathematically even if you're writing thing, the mathematics very informally. Perhaps with pseudocode or, pass or plus cal, if you're specifying how something does it. So how do you learn to write specs? By writing formal specs, you know, even, if you don't, even if you never need to write a completely formal spec in your life, learning to write formal specs will really help you learn to write the informal specs that you'll need to write. You learn to write programs by writing them, running them, and correcting your errors. You can learn to write formal specs by writing them, running them with a model checker, and correcting your errors. Now, TLA plus may not be the best language for you. You know, it's, I'm sure it's not the best language for formal language for every kind of specification in the world. No language can be. Uh, it may not be the best formal language you know, for what your particular needs are. But I do know that it's great for learning to think mathematically. So uh, unless you can find something better for doing that, you know, which works, uh, use TLA+, plus, you know, learn TLA+, plus, learn to think mathematically. How do you connect the spec to the code? Well, you have comments connecting mathematical concepts and their implementation. For example, the mathematical concept might be a graph, and the implementation would be an array of node objects and an array of link objects. Uh, and this connection, you know, the, the specification, especially if it's an informal specification, should be in the comments, and so should the explanation of how those mathematical comments are implemented in the code. So what about coding? I mean, where programs involve writing code, you have to write code. I have nothing to say about writing code. Nothing I've said implies anything. You still have to think while you code, which means you have to write while you're coding. But what you write while you're coding is, is code. And I have nothing to say about how you should code. Use any programming language you want, any programming methodology. You still, you're still going to have to test and debug your program. You're not this, getting, writing a spec isn't going to catch coding errors because it's not about coding. It'll catch algorithm errors. You know, writing specs is an additional step. And it may save time by catching errors early when they're easier to correct. No promises there. It certainly will improve your programming. So you'll be writing better programs. So why are programmers reluctant to write specs? Well, writing is hard. Writing is hard, in fact, because thinking is hard. You know, there's no royal road to mathematics, as uh, who was it who said that? Archimedes, I think. Uh, why is writing hard? Well, because writing requires thinking, and thinking is hard. And as I said, it's easier to think you're thinking. <laughs> writing is a lot like running. The less you do it, the slower you are. And you have to strengthen your writing muscles, you know, just like you have to strengthen your, your running muscles. It takes practice. And it's easier to find an excuse not to. And one of the nicest excuses is, well, what if the spec is wrong? Maybe you made a mistake in the spec. Uh, maybe the requirements change or some enhancement is needed. In fact, uh, and the code will have to be changed, maybe even before the program is finished. In fact, cha the cho changing the code is something that eventually happens to all useful programs. If your program is useful, it's going to have users. The users are going to find things, extra things they want of it, uh, the things that don't work the way you, know, you thought was a good idea, but your uh, customers you know, decide otherwise. This happens, eventually happens to all useful programs. In an ideal world, you'd write a new spec, and you know, the code, you'd completely rewrite the, uh, the spec. Well, we all know this isn't going to happen. In the real world, the code is patched, and if you're lucky, the spec is updated. Well, if this is inevitable, why bother writing specs in the first place if you know, this all 
lovely thing is, you know, the spec turns out, you know, it has to be changed and, you know, we're back in our old messy world. Well, there are two reasons. The first reason is that whoever has to modify the code will be eternally grateful for every word or formula of specification that you write. And whoever may be you, believe me, I've you know, done that, you know, coming back, uh, and don't have time to tell you stories, but particularly, you know, modifications of the pretty printer, in fact. Uh, and that's why you should update the spec when you change the code. The second reason is that every time code is patched, it becomes a little uglier, harder to understand, and harder to maintain. Uh, and if you, but if you don't start with a spec, every piece of code you write is a patch, which means the program starts out from the beginning being ugly, hard to understand, and hard to maintain. And then God help you when you do have to maintain, you know, and try to figure it out what it's doing in order to, uh, to make changes. As Dwight Eisenhower said, no battle was ever won according to plan, but no battle was ever won without one. So some people will tell you that writing specs is a waste of time. In some situations it may be. Sometimes there's no need to think about what you're doing. Maybe something is really so trivial that it you know, doesn't need much thought. But remember, when they're telling you not to write a spec, they're telling, really telling you not to think. And, you know, thinking is a really good idea. And don't trust anybody who tells you not to do it. Thinking doesn't guarantee that you won't make mistakes. But not thinking generally guarantees that you will. Find out more about TLA Plus, uh, go to my homepage and click on uh, the link to the TLA webpage. Thank you. Uh, I think there's time for a few questions. Very few, I think. Uh, one here? Yes? Uh, I hope Hi. that's not a judgment on my talk. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. How about specification by example? It's a pragmatic approach that is a little bit inspired by test-driven development, which um, since it's not complete, of course, but since completeness anyway is undecidable, it's a good uh, pragmatic approach. So do you have no, any thoughts No, it's a terrible pragmatic approach. <laughs> it's maybe a good, uh, maybe a good way to, to explain something. Examples are great to explain them, but they're terrible. They keep you from thinking. You think in terms of these particular examples. The real problem in programming is not to think of you know, the easy cases, the obvious cases, the nice case. It's the hard cases. And you don't get that with examples. And boy, I can tell you, I do eclipse programming. Uh, and I've, uh, you know, there's so, much, so many methods of, in eclipse that are explained by, here's an, here, here's an example of code using it. And, I have yet to manage to use those uh, methods to do what, what I want to do because it doesn't work. I find that it just doesn't work on anything other than that example and I have no idea why not. Not, you know, program, you know programming by example, I don't know about, you know, if that works, but a specification by example doesn't. Thank you for the great talk. Um, so what happens once you patch the code? Do you suggest keeping the old specs around or do you just get rid of them? Like, does it help to have context? Uh, well, first of all, I think whenever I, well, whenever I do fix bugs, uh, and that may require changing the spec, I will also make a note as to why I changed the spec because, you know, Two years later, I'm going to come back and say, why did I do that? Uh, about whether, you know, to what extent that's useful uh, for the specification itself, 
I don't know. It's certainly always a good idea not to throw anything away. You know, we shouldn't be throwing you know, information away these days. You know, it doesn't cost anything to save it. So you should certainly save the old specs. Whether you should, you know, whether you should mention the change in the, in the new spec, uh, I, don't, I don't have any, any good answer to that. Without, one, <clears throat> without wanting to um, be rude or anything, I think most programmers don't use formal specifications anymore. My PhD was in that background. Most programmers these days, they take algorithms, they take code, they adapt it to what they want to do. And that's 99% is from my perspective how most software is built these days. Um, that we actually, it would really be nice if, it, if that were, it could be built, built well that way. Uh, it doesn't work because uh, they're trying to use, um, I find that it doesn't work because the, the p other pieces of code that I want to use don't have specifications. So I really can't use them very well. I do the best I can and I wind up having to spend uh, a hell of a lot of time trying to figure out what this piece of code does, uh, which is something I shouldn't have to do if it had been specified. Uh, and again, I've said that 95% you know, of programming uh, you know, requires very little specification. And you know, a few lines uh, you know, are usually enough. But you, know, you are going to come up with this 5%, which isn't just you know, take this thing and put it here and combine it with this thing. There are going to be something, some things, code you're going to have to write that is subtle. It has some, uh, some, a bit of difficulty in it. And you want to be able to, you know, you want to be prepared for that. Because if you use the same techniques that you use, you know, the same lack of thought that you use when you're doing that other 95%, you're going to screw up badly. Um, unfortunately, I have never really looked into TLA++, uh, plus, uh, but uh, having studied uh, temporal logic, it is inevitable uh, to, to um, fail to, to notice that, that there's a lot of temporal logic going on underlying what you've been saying. So I was wondering, um, have you studied, um, probably you have uh, the possibilities for using more directly the language of temporal logic with future operators, necessity operators, and all that uh, okay. stuff. And uh, so. Okay, <laughs> TLA stands for the temporal logic of actions. Uh, temporal logic is evil. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you explain why, because it's very hard to use, but it turns out it's a necessary evil. Uh, Temporal logic turns out to be the best way of thinking about liveness. And so if you use TLA+, when you get to the liveness part, you're going to be using temporal logic and be aware of it. But remember that I said that safety is more important. And it turns out that you do not need to think, you do not need to know temporal logic in order to handle safety. And what the reason I think, you know, that TLA plus is better than other kinds of temporal logic is that you know, need to know essentially no temporal logic to use it for safety. Uh, if you look at the actual specification, there is the, specific, the TLA specification, I've noticed I've written it as two formulas, init and next. Well, TLA allows you to combine them into a single temporal logic formula, which you, you, know, you do at the end eventually. And, but the idea, the thing that makes it great is that you'll write a thousand line specification, 999 lines are going to be ordinary math, initial predicate and next state relation, and then the last line is going to be a temporal logic formula. So, okay. That's it. Right, well, do we have, no. So, we are now at the end of our plenary session, and I'd like to thank Leslie very much, but before we do that, just to remind you all, we got the buses outside to go out to the dinner tonight. Take your bags with you. There will be space there for your bags. And then we'll be going back to the hotels or coming back here. And now, thank you very much, Leslie. <laughs>